Welcome back to Call Time with Katie Bierenbaum. I've really loved interviewing theater's best and brightest these past few weeks and also connecting with an amazing theater loving audience. I think I was right and everyone is really hungry for it and we're really eager for theater to get back. And this is yet another way to connect with um, the theater people that we miss. So it's been a joy of mine. Um, and I think my next guest is going to be a joy of yours if she isn't already a joy in your life. Um, the sweet, the bubbly, the fabulous actress and singer and dancer, Chelsea Groen. Chelsea Cree Groen is your, is your actor's equity name. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm sorry I messed up your equity name. It's okay. It's okay. My grandma Korea will uh will might might call you, but <laughs> Okay, okay. I'll be awaiting a call from not your agents, but from your grandma. grandma Korea. So first, um, I wanted to take a moment to introduce you to our viewers if they don't already know you. Chelsea started out her career as something of a child star. She performed as Annie and Annie. Maybe I'll make you sing The Sun Will Come Out Tomorrow later. So she did that all over the country for years, in addition to performing in many regional productions in her home state of Arizona. She then graduated with a BFA from the University of Michigan's musical theater program, after which she performed at theaters like the Muni, Theater Aspen, Theater by the Sea, and Berkshire Theater Group, where we met back in 2016. And most recently, she was traveling around the country as Minnie Fay in the national tour of the Bette Midler, Bernadette Peters, Donna Murphy, De Hello Dolly revival, which is honestly like me saying it as your friend is still a pinch me moment for me. So I can only imagine what it's like for you. Ah, uh, thank you for that intro. Um, yeah, I mean, it, I just loved the show so much and I know you did too. I, I feel like you saw it multiple times. I only saw it once, but I probably like talked about it a lot. I, so. I remember you like getting your tickets far, far in advance. <laughs> yes. Um, but I, cause I didn't see it until like two weeks before it closed on Broadway or maybe I think the last week cause one of my good friends, Michael Hartung was in it and I saw it and I didn't really, I, I hadn't even seen the movie before. And I, and I literally like just, me and Evan were just like, beaming the whole time and I've truly never felt so much joy like just pure joy and like wonder and ever and I just was like crying happy tears so many times and I remember literally leaving and being like god I wish I could see that like five more times and I saw Donna Murphy um and then I got to do it and I got I you know I had when I was rehearsing I had to see it multiple times and and then I got to hear it every night. What a joy. And and it's so nice because I very much think of you as an actor that spreads joy um, when she works. So it's very full circle and very appropriate that that was your last big credit. But we will definitely get to that in detail. Um, but I wanna start with where we started with your bio which is that I think not a lot of people know that you started this professional career when you were a child. So I'm wondering what that was like for you and whether you think it gives you something of a different perspective on your career or on theater now as an adult. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really interesting because I, you know, I think as a child, I, I did like my first children's theater show when I was like, five and I started taking ballet when I was two and I just I was always putting on shows I, we would go to restaurants and I would literally like go from table to table and ask people if they wanted me to sing for them <laughs> like my parents <laughs> like I like I literally like I was remembering like in therapy the other day <laughs> that I would like in like elementary school like at lunch I would stand on the tables and sing and I was like, how annoying. But I just was so obsessed with performing. And I was like the star of Arizona. I was a star of my family. I was a star of everyone I knew. And and I got every role that I ever auditioned for. I got so many like awards as a child and like worked very consistently. And, and so I think it was very – it it's an interesting perspective 
to sort of get so much gratification and praise as a child and then you know then I got into the best universe you know musical theater program one of the best in the in the country and everyone there was a star everyone was the star of their town and I wasn't special anymore <laughs> and it was really good because I think my ego really needed some humbling um from all the praise I was getting from my parents um and community and it was it was good to be like okay like you're not that great and and like everyone is and just sort of made me it, it set me up to then go to New York and receive a lot more rejection <laughs> so it was I was really thankful to sort of have that like uh, you know uh what do they say small fish in a big pond yeah you were you were first a big fish in a small yeah. pond and then you became yeah which I really really needed um and so so I think Michigan was a good like for middle middle ground for then you know for me to for me to get get used to not getting every role that I auditioned for yeah I was gonna ask you um later about that transition from college to a professional well you as you say you had been doing professional theater as a child but that crucial transition from college to New York theater and beyond um because I definitely think of you as a person who like did a bunch of regional theater and a bunch of workshops and other sort of like pounding the pavement projects and yeah I'm just curious what that sort of paying your dues transition was like yeah well you know, I will say it was very different than what I expected. It was very different. What did different. you expect? I expected to like <laughs> go and I went, went to Michigan and I expected to go and book Broadway. Because the other thing about M Michigan was like, we only heard our teachers talk about the like successful alumni. We right. didn't have alumni who were on uh, talk about waking up at 6 a.m. and getting in line for open calls and like what their side jobs were. And and like how, what you have to do to make money to afford to live in the city and try to balance that with auditioning and like hopefully getting something. So, um, yeah. And it was, you know, I will go back to the, the child acting thing because another sort of thing that I realized when I got to Michigan that I was super frustrated about was I graduated without my equity card, but I technically could have had it twice before so I as a kid you know I was doing all these regional theater productions and of course my mom you know my mom didn't know my mom didn't know to like get me sign me up for equity points or like actually yeah. get an equity yeah. contract but you know I also was like getting all of these when I did specifically when I did Annie at the Agunquit Playhouse I was Annie and it's so close to New York and, and a lot of agents were coming and people were like giving my mom their card and asking me to audition for stuff in New York. And, and my mom was like, I want her to be a normal kid. Like, I don't want to do this. And I remember being like, oh, mom, but I am really grateful that I had a normal childhood and that I did have, that I went to a really good school, you know, elementary school and middle school and high school where I was academically challenged and had other interests and had normal friends. And I think that I would have been a lot different person if I had just moved to New York and just started, kept going as a kid. Um, but, and then, so I, and then I, then I worked at the Mimi in college and one of my teachers at Michigan said, don't take your equity card because they give it to you when you work there. Everyone is offered their equity card, um, which is rare. Um, that's not something that usually happens. Um, right. And my teacher was like, it was my junior year. And he was like, you know, like you look so young and often equity contracts are like not offered to like the young girl role, you know, in regional theaters, which is true. And he was like, I just, I think that you're going to work more if you don't take it. But then I got to New York and I didn't have my equity card and I couldn't, you know, I got a job at like a gym as a personal trainer. Cause I was like, I don't want to work in restaurants. Um, so I got certified to be a personal trainer the summer before I moved and I was working at New York sports club and trying to make money to like pay my rent. And then I was super discouraged because 
a lot of my friends had their equity cards or didn't have to work, didn't need to, yeah, you know, get jobs to pay for their apartment. And, and so I would go and like not get seen. And I sort of was like frustrated and sort of gave up very quickly. And I think it's because I, you know, I wasn't used to really hustling Um, and so I sort of more, and I also was like experiencing a lot of anxiety and like having panic attacks and just wasn't, I don't think ready to move to New York. Um, but because I went to Michigan, I was like, this is what we have to do. I don't want people to judge me for not moving right away. But mentally I was like shaky and, and really anxious and really worried about this transition So I just think that I wasn't really myself for the first, honestly, like two years. And I had multiple agents who I sort of was frustrated with. And once I really like started meditating and like finding myself and calming down and getting my anxiety under control and sort of like rediscovering why I loved musical theater Cause it's easy to forget when like you're not doing shows and you're getting, you know, not getting seen even for auditions. So once I really sort of got my stuff together, everything just sort of fell into place more. One of my favorite things about you and a big reason why I wanted you to come on the show is, and which you can tell from the start of this interview already is that you're so candid. And I think So many of us, especially in musical theater, certainly in the past, were taught like, oh, we have to be always on and we have to present this sort of front to the world. And even though you very much are this bubbly, girly, funny, kind persona, you also are extremely candid and open about the other things in your life, which I really appreciate. And I just wanted to say too, that like, you can tell what kind of person Chelsea is just from the start of this interview. Um, But I do want to get back to what you were saying about like returning to why we love that, that, that art form, why we love musical theater, because um, I think it's interesting that you were basically working from the time you were five. And then, as you said, you went to like the best musical theater program in the country and then move to New York to try to work more. So I'm wonder, I'm curious if there is a moment even before you were five when you were like, oh, this is for me. Can you even remember that? Or is it just like, it was obvious forever? Yeah, I mean, I, there, I think there were multiple moments. I, I, tr- I do literally remember like the first musical that my mom took me to is Beauty and the Beast. It was a national tour of Beauty and the Beast. And I, I was three. Um, and we lived in San Diego. So it was like in LA. And before th- I was obsessed with ballet already. I was already like, I when did that c- come about? Was it just like your mom put you in and you were like, I, I love like, it? My- yeah, my mom put me in and I just, I think I just had a lot of natural talent And I think, you know, I was like two and they like put me in the class with like the seven year olds, like, because I like already, I think, I I don't know, this is like so random, but my mom literally, my mom was a dancer, my mom was a gymnast, and she literally like stretched me as a baby. So I was like, (laughs) and like doing everything like full extension, because I was like stretched and primed for like dancing as an infant. Um, And I just was always watching and I just was like, really passionate I don't I mean I don't know but and I think Disney movies like I was always putting on shows and um and I was really really obsessed with ballet and my mom took me to the ballet at first and then I saw Beauty and the Beast like on stage and it was my first Broadway show are you serious Mm -hmm. oh my god so I was like oh I want to do that I can sing and dance and pretend and act like this is amazing. And I was always like a different character. My mom had to like bribe me not to wear costumes to school because I always wanted, and I would like make her call me Belle. I would make her call me Clara from the Nutcracker. Like I never wanted to be Chelsea. Like I was always pretending. Um, Yeah. And then I think, you know, again, like going to New York, the first 
the first show I saw on Broadway. I was 12. My grandpa took me to New York and I saw Wicked and I was like, yeah, I'm going to be, I want to be in that. Um, yeah. And I just think, you know, being in shows, it was a constant reminder. Like this is where I feel the most joy and the most fulfilled. And, and yeah. And then I think for a couple, the first year, um, cause I was working, you know, I did like summer, I would always like book summer stock and do shows at school, but but then I, I moved and I didn't get anything for like a year. And then I did get a show. I got it. I booked Fiddler on the Roof at Pioneer Theater. And I was in rehearsals for two weeks. I was playing Hava. And I then had to be rushed to the emergency room to get surgery. I had like a massive ovarian cyst that I had to get surgery on. And then I couldn't do the show because it was like a, a long recovery. So that was like a, oh, I booked something like and then the summer after I graduated, and then I couldn't do it. So it was sort of like, I forgot, I wasn't being reminded, I was constantly reminded of why I love this, because I was constantly performing, I was constantly getting like that positive feedback. And then I didn't have it. And I think it was sort of like, all I was seeing was the, the things that sucked about it. Yeah. And comparing yeah. myself to my friends who immediately were successful. And I think that obviously is not what you're, you shouldn't do that. Don't compare yourself to others. Don't look sideways. Only look forward. Like Mr. Wagner said, says from Michigan. But, um, so I think that was another hard thing for me as I was like, Oh, like what the heck? All my friends are doing stuff, but like, why am I not? And, and I truly believe that I just wasn't my best self. And I wasn't, I wasn't, I was anxious in the room. I was like, tired I was I didn't really feel like I wanted it even the first like year or two um and then I just but you know I really think Fiorello being in Fiorello sort of like revived the love and joy for me I should say for those of you who don't know this show because I mentioned we met doing this show in Berkshire Theatre Group which was Fiorello which then transferred to New York to the classic stage company theater um Yes, I should just say that's the that's the show we met on. And that was, you were two years out of school at that point? Yeah, yeah. So that was really the first show that I did. It was two years since I had done a show. And that was obviously the longest I've ever gone. Um, and then I had that sad experience that I sort of was like, oh, maybe this isn't meant to be. I think that's sort of how I felt. Um, because that was a, obviously an, not something in my control. Um, but yeah, and it was just like, and Evan, you know, my, now my husband was the music director and we didn't tell anyone, we didn't, he didn't tell the director or like the artistic director that I was his girlfriend when we auditioned. And so, so I think you guys weren't married yet. If it's weird. No, no, we're not married. You've been through our whole journey. Um, we were dating, but we were living together. And he felt, he he was like, we were like, oh, do we tell him, do we not? And he was like, I just feel like I want you to get it on your own. And I will never forget that audition. And you had, they, everyone, I walked in the room and Evan was behind the table and everyone stands up behind the table and sh reaches out to shake your hand. And I've never been in audition where they come and they shake your hand. Usually they're like, hi, or like barely look up at you. But they all were like, hi. And then Evan reaches out to shake my hand. <laughs> and I was like, hey. <laughs> it was so awkward. Um, but then obviously like, they cast me and Evan was like, you should know that this is my girlfriend. Um, but it was just so much fun. And I just think it was such a fun, like, such a fun character who I also feel like I really identified with. And I, um, yeah, and then to just do it for so long and with the same, the same group and to do it in New York and have all of our friends come you know, it, and it was really, it really was literally like being in a show, but it was a show that I loved and a character that I loved. And it sort of launched my, my momentum back up. That's great to hear. Cause I definitely think of that show and that group and that creative team, like they will always have the most special place in my heart. 
And I feel like it's, it's nice for me to hear that because I feel like that's not a unique thing. I think most of the people in it or who were involved with it would feel the same way. But I have so many questions based on that. My first being, I sort of alluded to this before, um, I definitely think of you as playing a certain type of role, which is sort of like the funny, girly, flirty, um, effervescent sort of sidekick supporting character. And I'm wondering if, if you feel that way, it's definitely a sort of typecasting of a kind. And then also just, what are your thoughts on typecasting? Like, do you like to lean into that? Or is part of you like, God, I wish I could do something totally different? In the well, I'm so glad you asked that question because when I auditioned, I auditioned for Taya. And I am like a- Whoa, soprano. I didn't know that. Yeah. I'm a soprano and I like love singing soprano. And I always was like, I'm like an ingenue and I'm like the romantic- lead and then and then I auditioned and Evan was texting me and they were like they like you for Dora like I think that you're much better for Dora and I was like no I want to be the main girl like I want to sing when did I fall in love and he was like just like you're just I was like what did they you know and I and I remember having a hard time honestly coming to terms with my type because like and Evan is an accompanist often you know, for that audition, he wasn't the accompanist, but I often will audition for like open calls or like appointments and Evan is the accompanist. And it's sort of nice because I can be like, what did they say about me? And like, usually I'm like, what did they say about me? And they're like, oh, she's adorable. They're always like, oh my God, she is so cute. Like, ah, uh, and I'm like, oh, why do I always have to be like adorable? Like that makes me feel like I'm like a baby. Right. But I you know what? But then I just was like, you know what? I just need to embrace this because clearly that's how people see me and that's how I am. No one's ever gonna be like, oh, she's so elegant. Although that's what the song, one of the main songs I sing in the love tell me. Um, but that was like the joke that we weren't elegant. Um, but yeah, so I think I really once I got that role and I was like, oh, this is like the fun role and this is me and I'm funny. And like, I, I think I was pushing back from that because I was like, but I want to be this girl. I don't want to be like the best friend, but those parts are so much more fun, I think. And they're just so much more me. Like I'm silly and like, just naturally, I'm just not and my face is very expressive I've learned people think that I'm hilarious when I'm not even trying to be because I just like do things with my face <laughs> that I'm not even aware of and then people are like laughing and I'm like I wasn't even trying to be funny. I do find it hard to believe that you didn't think of yourself as funny before that experience because even just talking with you now like you are funny well I think I'm funny I think I'm hilarious <laughs> glad we got that on the record but, but and you know and I really do think that it took that part to be like okay this is what I like this is who I am and 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 those are all the parts that I've played really I mean I guess I played Cosette who's not really funny um but but yeah so so I'm glad that I that I had that and it just sort of was like me I think my like my ego being like no but so that's what was the other question oh how do I feel about typecasting I mean I think like you know we're doing what we're what we've been doing is teaching all these zoom classes for kids auditioning for college and even middle school kids who are trying to be professional kid actors and that's like a main thing that we talk about is type. Um, and like, what is wow, even that early? Yeah. Well, I think, I think so because we really didn't talk a lot about it in college, honestly. And I think that's why I didn't really come out of, I right. love Michigan. I love my experience there, but, but we really, I didn't come out of there having like a really strong sense of my type. Do you think people's types are most often tied to like who they are most truly on the inside? Or do you think it just totally depends? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think it should be because what I've learned from my, from my experience, from my auditioning is that there are so many talented people and there is always going to be someone more talented. And there's also always going to be someone who could, you know, they're, when they're seeing auditioning for, 
you know, a role, whatever show that they're doing, like there's going to be so many people who come in and they're going to be like, oh yeah, that person could do it. Like she's very talented. But I think you have to walk in the room and literally be that part. And that's when you get it. It's like the the times that you get it, you the times that you get a role are when they're literally like, oh, you are that person. Mm. And that's been my, that's been my experience. And that's been sort of what I've, what I've realized based on things that I've yeah. gotten. Yeah, I think that's interesting, especially to coming, cause I, you mentioned, and I know this about you that you are a phenomenal dancer and you started ballet and dancing first, even before you came to theater. Um, and so I'm curious when you are, when you think about like the trifecta of like dancing, singing, acting, when you are like closing your eyes and thinking about what is going to make you most happy, or even when you are closing your eyes and thinking about like your access point to theater, is it the dance? Is it the movement? No, it's, it's not actually. And it's, it's interesting because I sort of think, um, I, I think, I don't know, because I, I think I, I would always felt very strong as a dancer and, um, but I just, I sort of, I guess, you know, with speaking of my agent, like I'm not often submitted for like chorus calls and, and I don't think, and I'm sure. Which and probably, I, as I was going to say, it has to do with your type yeah. or the reality. Like you're not a Stroman girl. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. And I'm like, and I also don't, I don't feel strong about, tap. I'm not like a strong tapper and I've. I mean, I wasn't thoroughly modern Millie, so I could pull it off, but like, I just don't have a lot of tap experience, but like, I think it depends on the show. Like, um, but my, this is sort of an interesting thing because I think I, I think I sort of was, I'm always like, oh, I want to play a role and usually, but I, I feel like so many things that I've been able to do are like, I also get to dance. Like I get to have a song and be funny and say words and also do a little dance yeah um so so that's that's been that's been really cool but um I will say my my first agent that I had um who I'm no longer with um I when Hello Dolly was originally auditioning on Broadway kept emailing my agent to be like could I could you like try to push for me to audition for this and he was like oh I submitted you for the understudy but you know I just know you know I have clients who've been in the lab and it's it's Warren Carlisle and they say it's the hardest dance that they've ever done and these are like Broadway dancers and I just you're just not a strong enough dancer unfortunately and I know that everyone needs to be a dancer and I'm like okay well I am a dancer and you don't know me but of course having that come from my agent was like oh, well, I guess I'm not. And he multiple times would say, like, I would be like, could you submit me for this? And he'd be like, I just don't see you as a dancer. And I was like, but you've never seen me dance. And then I remember he came to Fiorello and he was like, oh my God, you were dancing. And I was, and Evan literally was like, because he knows this has been a thing. He was like, yeah, she's a dancer. (laughs) But I, but I, but having him tell me that over and over again, like, I don't see you as a dancer. I believed it. And so after that, I sort of was like, he does not believe in me. And I, I dropped him and I'm really glad that I did. And I got new agents who believed in me. And it sort of was like, I remember like when I was in callbacks for it, I was like, I really hope I get it. So I could just show him that I, that I I was right for this. It's just sad. And like, unfortunately all too familiar to hear how, we let all these different people get in our heads as actors and let them tell us who we are when we should be presenting who we are to people, as you're saying with your type. You mentioned to Evan, of course, who we've sort of like talked around a bit. And for those who don't know, as you said, Evan is a music director and also a great pianist and accompanist. And I'm curious, I mean, I would ask you to answer for Evan as well, especially because you, before the pandemic began, you would have been on tour as would Evan have been. Mm -hmm. Um, I assume not seeing each other all that often or seeing each other very rarely. So I'm curious how you 
balance the being in the relationship, the marriage, the personal life with the demands of our careers? Yeah. Um, well, well, we, Evan and I were, we met in college at University of Michigan. He was a jazz major and he would play for people's voice lessons and the shows and rehearsals. So that's how we met. Um, and we've been together now for eight and a half years. Wow. Um, and we've been married for three, um, a little over three. So yeah, but we, I mean, we dated in college. We started dating my junior year. So we were in college together for two years Then I moved to New York. Um, and it was like, a he had one year left. He's a, he was a year younger than me. And, and you know, I was that, was a reason why I was sort of like all over the place in New York. And I was like, I miss my boyfriend. And I just was, uh, but it was really good for us to be apart. Um, and, and that sort of, we, we learned how to do long distance that way. And, and even when we were dating, I like went to Aspen for four months to do a show and we were always sort of you know, we because lived. That's in- always an aspect of the business. Like you could get a job yeah. at any time and have to go do yeah. something. So our whole it wasn't like a new thing. Like we knew we were both gonna sort of be be in this and and we've always like honestly, we thrive on long distance, I say. Like we are so good at communicating and we've had to, you know, because we've done it so many times. Like he gets a show and I get a show and and it always makes me appreciate him so much more when we're apart because I realize like all that he does um and then he's gone and I have to suddenly take out the trash and (laughs) (laughs) um and so so yeah I mean we were we on when we were on tour and sort of our 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 rule is we were always trying to see each other like every three weeks um and yeah, because we really love each other and we want to be together. And we, you know, we've gotten so many different credit cards, our airline credit cards to get the points to get free flights and, and stuff like that. And, and it, you know, we, yeah, we were preparing to, he had only been on tour with Wicked for like two months before this, this happened. And Hello Dolly, we happened to have a lot of layoffs. So it really wasn't that bad. I got to come home a couple times and he flew out to see me several times. So we were preparing for a year of, a, at least, I mean, he signed a year contract, but they want you, they want him to stay for as long as possible, which is amazing, um, of being apart. And now we are together 24 seven and we still <laughs> have fun and make each other laugh, which is pretty amazing. But I, you know, I think I'm sort of looking for this is here. I love him so much, but I'm sort of looking forward to like getting back to our, to my independence and like remembering how to function. Well, I think, yeah. Well, I think everyone is because I, I mean, I should say I haven't yet done, we sort of did a pandemic check-in before we started recording, but I, I, I think coupled with the relationship stuff and the pandemic being a part and then being together is just the natural, like our whole industry shut down. And that is a huge deal. Um, and so I'm curious too, for your take, how are you feeling about it at this moment in time when things are looking pretty hopeful, but also how has your year as a whole been? Yeah, you know, it's, it's been, it's been okay. It's, you know, it's been hard, but we've, we've made the most of it. We've been very fortunate to be able to keep our apartment in New York. And um, I'm just sort of someone who I don't like to sit still. And I don't, like to not have things to do so this has been challenging for me but I also immediately tried have been like trying so hard to keep myself busy and getting and you know you and I both have we did so much for the election I sort of was like that was like this is my purpose now like I'm gonna just put everything into this and like trying to constantly shift and find new projects Um, and new sort of ways to keep myself busy and schedule myself. And we've started sort of like an online, um, musical theater, zoom classes for kids around the country. And it's really built. And, um, we were, we were coaching a lot of kids with their college auditions and they're, they're starting to get accepted and that's really exciting. And 
we're really a good team because he he makes the tracks and he talks about the music and I talk about the acting and the dancing and singing so so it's been really you know we work very well together and we've also worked we've done shows together um so we're we're a good team but he's also like because he knows that he has this show that's a really good job to go back to he's not as worried he's not been as trying to like right trying as hard to get jobs and and do things he's sort of just like she's just sort of waiting and constantly checking the vaccine updates to, to find out when he can hopefully go back that's funny and I'm glad throughout you've mentioned the teaching that you do and I know you so I know that's something you love and have been doing a lot in addition to as you said being a personal trainer and also some directing choreographing and I'm curious first for your take on like the side hustle rap and whether you see it as like a necessary evil or something that's actually really important keeping you sane as a as an actor absolutely I I mean I I will say, I mean, it, it really, I've always been someone who works really hard and, and needs to sort of keep busy and feel, find other ways of fulfillment and have other interests. Mm -hmm. And, and I've been very lucky to, you know, sort of have clients, um, personal training clients. And then also I, love working with kids and I've I've done a lot of directing and choreographing and and it's so nice to have other things to like work on and focus on and places to go versus just obsessing over an audition and whether or not you're going to get it and waiting around and because really before when I'm not in a show I'm constantly just running around all over the place um and so this time has been good for me to be like it's okay to just like sit and like have feel my feelings um but but I also like you know it took me a really long time to book the this something as big as hello dolly and like five years um of being in New York and I really am so grateful that it did take me that long because it made me appreciate it so much more and just made me feel so grateful to be there because I think a lot of people take it for granted and a lot of these kids now are not even going to college and these Jimmy Awards kids are just coming and just booking Broadway right away and and then I think they get burnt out more quickly and and I said you know right at the beginning of this pandemic like I'm so thankful that I'm used to being an unemployed actor and that I have all of these other interests and ways that I know that I can make money and be useful and like still feel creative and feel like I'm contributing that I can do that it wasn't like oh no what am I gonna do I was like oh I have all these other things that I'm good at that we can just figure out how to make it work over zoom so I'm I I'm so happy that I have always had to have multiple part-time jobs and and have had to figure out other ways to stay sane and feel fulfilled yeah I think I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think you and I are very similar in that <laughs> I feel like I'm going to go crazy if I'm not <laughs> doing stuff all the time. Um, and I think that's one of the hardest, for me personally, that's been one of the hardest things about our business to feel like on any given day, if you're not in a show, uh, oh, what do I do? Um, and so I really, re it really resonates with me what you say about having these other things you can do and having other other ways to contribute, as you say, um, which makes me think too, and you work with all these kids and you're training them and you're coaching them. Is there any specific advice you would give for anyone who is watching, who wants to be in musical theater, who's an aspiring singer, actor, dancer, and looking to carve out a, a, a path similar to yours? Yeah, I mean, I really... I really would just say never give up and and keep advocating for yourself. I, you know, I think that was something that was just like keep 
believing in yourself and keep loving yourself. I think that's that's so important because it's so easy to feel like you're not enough and you're not good enough and it's not going to it's not going to be worth it. But if you you know, if you really can't imagine yourself doing anything else, then you have to do it. And like it you know, I mean, it's just this this time also has made me realize like how lucky we are to do what we really, really love. And most people don't do that. Most people just sit and at a desk and and wait for the day to pass by so that but to make just to make money. And and this whole time I've resisted getting a a, a new full time job because I just I'm just not ready. Like I, I just want to keep performing. I want to be on stage and, and I know that's what I need to do. And so I just think like, don't give up and keep believing in yourself. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and it comes full circle to what we were talking about at the beginning of our discussion about just the sheer unadulterated joy that you feel in performing. That's so infectious when someone watches you perform and, I feel like we're all chasing all those of us who are performers are always chasing that feeling. Yeah. Uh, and it can be easy to forget, as you say, in the like nitty gritty of the business, but you have to keep going back to it. Um, and that's why I'm really glad. Uh, I always end my shows with a segment that I call the thank you five segment. Mm. Which are five rapid fire questions that you should just answer with the first thing that comes into your head. Um, and I think they'll be fun. And they're sort of more about the joy of performing on stage and, and favorite things that you like. So does that sound good? You ready? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, first of all, dream role. Uh, it's so basic, but Glenda and Wicked. You would kill it, of <laughs> course. When you were talking about um, going to see Wicked, I was like, I bet you really liked Glinda. Um, something you can't live without as an actor, singer, dancer. And that can be like esoteric or it can be as simple as like a binder for your, <laughs> for your music. <laughs> I mean, as an actress, singer, dancer, I mean, right now, the two things that I'm feeling that I can't live without are number one, my dog, because she brings me a lot of joy, and also my Peloton, which no, I just got, and I'm so obsessed with it, and it's bringing me so much joy. Um, So those are the things that I can't live without, like, right now, and like, usually as an actress, singer, dancer. Huh, honestly, this is, I would say I can't live without Evan's abilities um, to, to play for me. My, my live in accompanist um, that I don't have to pay. And I can just say, because I'm really bad at sight reading, I can't read music and um, I don't play piano. And so I just, I don't have to pay anyone. I just give it to Evan. I never have to worry about not learning a new song. I just say, Evan, can you teach me this? That is <laughs> a lot really unreal that is a luxury because I've definitely been there texting all the pianists I know being like I'll pay you $30 please help me yep. great answers maybe we'll get a brand deal from Peloton I hope so I'm waiting <laughs> um, favorite city you perform you performed in on the Hello Dolly tour my favorite city was Philly um what? I loved it so much we were there for two weeks and it's like it's like a quainter, cleaner, like more historic New York, I feel. Like it was just, it was so cool. It was just such a fun city. There was so much to do. It was so beautiful. The theater was the most beautiful theater we performed at. I was obsessed. Wow, that sounds great. You know, I've never actually been to Philly, which is weird. So I'll have oh, to check it out. We should go. Let's go, road trip. <laughs> um, favorite role you've ever played? You know, oh gosh. Um, I I think this is like it was it was a reading that I did. Um, but I I got to do this this like version of Peter Pan. Um, that was a reading, and I played Tinkerbell, and I it was just the most me, and I sort of got to help create it, and they sort of made it like I got to do point and do a dance on point and sing 
also sing really high and be really funny. Um, and so it was like everything that I love to do and like just being like absurd. Um, and that was, that was the most fun I've ever had doing. I remember seeing those pictures. They were incredible. And then finally, this is very tailored to you as I know you, the best spot in New York for gluten-free treats and then the best spot in Ann Arbor for gluten-free food. Oh, there's so many. Um, well, my my favorite like gluten free restaurant is Nizza um, in New York. You know, I love Nizza because they have this bread that is just like the best bread I've ever had, and I dream about it all the time. Um, and they stopped serving it briefly over the the pandemic, but now it's back. They have the homemade pasta, like any pasta you want. Um, I also love macaroons. I love the Macaroon Cafe, which is also closed, and I'm very sad um, about it. But um, And then my favorite place in Ann Arbor is Zingerman's, which is most people's favorite places in Ann Arbor. But it was literally the first gluten-free sandwich I've ever had. They make homemade gluten-free bread there, and I'll – you know, it's, it will obviously always be very special for me because it was the first time I ever had a gluten-free sandwich. As someone who has family who went to Michigan and did a summer program at Michigan, I also love Zingerman's. Um, so that feels like a perfect note to end on. Well, thank you so much, Chelsea, for chatting with me and for being so candid and open with me and lovely as you always are. Thank you for, for having me. It was so much fun to chat. Chelsea's a really wonderful actor. Check her out. Uh, she was just doing the Hello Dolly tour and I'm sure we're gonna be hearing much more, many more great things from her. And um, stay tuned uh, for more episodes of Call Time. Uh, next week is actually a special soon to be revealed episode. So stay tuned for that. Really excited.